Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. We generally did things the right way. We weren't the jerks. We weren't, right? Like we, we tried to not just play by the rules, but kind of like rules that we could, you know, a code that we could sleep with at night. And that was super, super important to us. Who is uh, Nilan Choksi? Is that how you pronounce it? Choksi. Choksi, yeah. Yeah. What's been your journey? Yeah. Well, first off, uh, I'm a dad of two wonderful kids, um, two wonderful and kind kids. Uh, one's a senior and one's a freshman in high school and a husband. And at the end of the day, I think that's who I really am. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, this question is probably a little bit more uh, kind of uh, background and stuff like that. So uh, I really like it's 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 interesting. This simple question: Who is um, there? There was this uh, person back home that would always ask uh, or start an interview with that question, and I always found it interesting. Like just based on how people respond to that question, like <laughs> and how people interpret that question. So it's not an original or something that. You know, I just started, but it was something that always impressed me. It's just a simple question and the way that people, so I'm not intended, like, it's just, who who do you, because, you know, who? how do you see yourself? How do you think others see you? And Yeah. No, I I feel like that, my family does come first. So I, I that that is who I am. So I feel like that is where I have to start with. And then, and then, you know, um, but uh you know, first generation American. My uh, parents came over in 1969. I was born in 1970. I grew up in a, a small town in Texas, in South Texas, called Corpus Christi. Um, one uh, one would argue I'm a bit overeducated. Uh, I was a chemical engineer undergrad at MIT. Um, was part of the MIT blackjack team of 21 and bringing that bringing down the house fame. Yeah. And then uh, my first job out of college, I, I tried to follow the chemical engineering route. So it was at Exxon Research and Engineering. And then uh, while at Exxon, I got a master's from Stevens um, Institute and then went back to business school at the University of Chicago. And it really was at Chicago and then my quarter abroad at London Business School where I discovered kind of this passion for entrepreneurship. Um, I also met my wife at the University of Chicago, which was great. But uh, you know, out of business school, I tried strategy consulting, lasted about six months because I had the entrepreneurship bug. And to be honest, that was the last time I truly interviewed for a job. Wow. What is it about entrepreneurship? Is it the freedom? Is it the possibility? Like, what is it that, that maybe uh, drives you or that attracts you? <laughs> Because some people <laughs> just run away from it. It's like, I want stability. I want, you know, so. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I, I think if you asked any of my bosses over the years, it's probably because I wasn't real good with having a boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I, what I noticed in business school and, 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 and in London really was whenever an entrepreneurship came and talked to us, mm -hmm. um, like there was a different energy in me. There was a different level of excitement that no other job, no other kind of um, speaker would, you know, we got investment banking speakers and consulting speakers and, you know, marketing speakers and stuff like that. Nothing matched those, those stories and that, you know, I, I know the words for it now, but the grind, of working hard and trying to build something from nothing mm -hmm. and figuring everything is change right and figuring out the change and in, in, in the journey and the experience of that mm -hmm. um nothing matches that in my opinion yeah it's it's yeah i've i've been like going back and forth i started like i got uh fired uh from circuit city when i was uh, uh in high school and i remember i would go down to boston and party with people from back home 
Um, and I remember this guy, Mark, my manager, said, that he's like, Milan, you're the best worker when you're here, but I never know when you're going to show up. <laughs> uh, and that's how I ended up, like, just uh, trying things on my own and, like, enjoying the freedom and possibility uh, that, uh, you know, that entrepreneurship, like, some, to build something, to, I don't know. So um, I can relate a little bit to, to you know, what you're saying. Um what does agile to agility mean to you? I uh, obviously the name of my podcast says agile to agility. I wish I asked more people what that means to them because I think it's similar to the previous question. Yeah. <laughs> you get different answers. So, uh, what does it mean to you? You know, it's interesting. When I think of agile, I still think of the agile manifesto. I still think of it capital A Agile, which your podcast is a capital A. Mm -hmm. So um, I think almost definitionally, that's where my mind goes. Um, I think when you put the two words together and and, and kind of put a, a journey to it, Agile to Agility, yeah, yeah. Uh, in my head, I relate Agility much, like I relate Agile much more to the ceremonies of mm -hmm. Agile. And Agility to me kind of really means it's more related to almost lowercase agile mm -hmm. and for like my view of agility is each company agility is different things um mm -hmm. robin yemen used to always talk about the speed of relevance right for etsy delivering software 57 times a day or whatever it was makes a ton of sense exactly. but you know for a fighter jet once a month may be the speed of relevance, right, for, for delivery. So to me, I think agility is more about being lowercase agile in the real world. Yeah. And and then as a business person, you know, my bias is I probably lean more towards business agility when I think about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, agility is about reacting to changes, whether those are market conditions, whether those are internal changes, uh, you know, kind of et cetera. And then it's balancing those changes and, and what's hitting you mm. with this constancy of purpose um, when everything else is ar around you is moving. So I guess to me, sometimes it happens in microwaves, right? Micro, like in the micro, yeah. um, a competitor launches a new feature that you now have to compete with or that the market, you know, you have to do marketing against that new feature. Yeah. And then a lot of times, as I think back on my career, it starts to become a macro thing, right? Where you take lessons that you've learned from other walks of your life and literally you avoid stepping in it because yeah. you know, you know, what monsters are kind of lurking around the corner. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's a combination, but it, I think it's change and how you react to change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like uh, I, I, I was talking to several people and like one of the analogies that Jorgen uh, Hasselhoff, uh, even Dave Snowden uh, have alluded to it is uh, like a fitness. Right. And like what you said earlier is like, you know, uh, agility is different for different company. And like, you know, same way the fitness is different for different people. If you're a professional soccer player, it's different probably than if you're like a long uh, or short term distance runner or if you're whatever it is so like it really is in a context maybe of organizational fitness and i joke around if you're an insurance company and like everybody sucks in your <laughs> industry it's okay to suck right but if <laughs> you're uh you know amazon or google's of the world you have to be fit for that environment and for that competition so do you see that correlation between fitness and agility and is there yeah i i I think I do, right? Because every every person's definition of fitness is different, right? Like when I think about it, right? Like, you know, bodybuilders, there's a certain definition of fitness, right? And it's yeah. muscles kind of popping out everywhere and, and looking really good for a camera for a photo shot, right? Yeah. And then uh, you know, like I think for a 50-year-old, you know, father, <laughs> it's like you know am i healthy am i sleeping enough am i you know like it, it's kind of a little bit more basic but am i doing the things that's going to help me i've always appreciated a book called younger younger next year um yeah. great book if you haven't read it no I haven't. Um, but you know their their premise in this book is really how can you and and they state that up until kind of the age of 70 you really can do things to help yourself be younger next year. 
-hmm. And to me, that's been the definite, my working definition of fitness. Can I do a little bit of hard work, mm -hmm. um, you know, five times a week, I'm going to do a little bit of strength a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can I generally just do the things I want to do in my life without huffing and puffing and, <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah. And it's like so context specific. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, with the, the, the reason that I ask is, you know, probably like last 10 years specifically have ha, have been all about scaling frameworks, right? And, uh, you, you know, I think and I hope that the next 10 years is more about context specific. There's nothing wrong with frameworks, but I think uh, we've gotten so, uh, or organizations have gotten so addicted to like, oh, there's a simple solution uh, without, you know, thinking about context and uh, um, th nothing simple. Let, let's yeah. just be honest. If it was yeah. simple, it would have been done by now. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the other trick. Like yeah. there is no silver bullet. There is no quick fix, right? Like it, it is, it's work. And, and it really is that process of thinking. Uh, again, I'll bring this back to my children. Right. But yeah, um, uh, the principal at the freshman school kind of just announced like, look, the struggle is real, but going through the struggle for those kids is super, super important because it helps them stand on their own. It helps them know what to do when they get punched in the face. Yeah. And then, right, like, and to learn and grow and to react to that. And yeah. I think too many organizations, you know, do look for that quick fix. And I, I think they need to be okay with the struggle. They need to be okay with failing if they learn something right experimentation and 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 that constant learning i think is so important that i think is we're especially in america we're so used to those quick fixes and one things you know immediately that i think uh well that's the thing and like it reminds me and we might go off that one i'll, I'll probably oh, bring it back good. but like um <laughs> It, it, as a parent, like we were talking, uh, you know, last week about, you know, just kids and like I have a five year old kid and um, like grow, growing up during the Civil War in Boston for me, like uh, I had some guardrails, but like, you know, it was like it, it was that experience that really shaped a lot who I am. And they, <laughs> and like, uh, you know, I'm thinking I was talking to my friends and a lot of people, I guess, can relate to this, too. Like today, like, you know, uh, I'm like telling my son, don't do this. I'm like. Putting, like I'm not giving him enough freedom, you know, to fail. And it seems like, you know, it, it, it can be related back to the organizations where like you got to trust and let people fail and like learn and, and uh, embrace that uncertainty rather than, you know, just trying to control things. And uh, um, I don't know, as I said, we might be all <laughs> going off, but <laughs> that, 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 concept of just creating that safe environment and, and being able to just let go rather than manage yeah. um, seems like it's a natural thing to do yet we kind of do the opposite yeah I, I think you know this is definitely a tangent but I, I mean I have an MBA so I think I can say this but you're kind of taught in business school you know you can control everything and you can write a, you know, you produce a PowerPoint presentation and that's the answer. Right. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, I think there is something to like, you know, are we teaching the future managers, the future leaders, how to get the most out of their people, how to trust, how to get across the, the culture and the values of the organization yeah. And and point people in the right direction, but then let them figure out their journey. Almost and, like create that environment, um, you know, uh, for people to, to 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 be able to experience that, rather than just trying to to, to <laughs> uh, you know tell them what to do. And a lot of times, when I talk to managers, when I talk to leaders, uh, it, it, it's it, you can see that this idea of. Uh, you know, defining a process, ingraining, like, without creating some guardrails, just like, you know, follow the process. And that's a lot of times, uh, you know, I guess the directive, but uh, uh, um, maybe to bring it back, I want to know how did you and your uh, fraternity brothers at MIT go to Las Vegas and beat the house of the blackjack? <laughs> I want to get to the fun stuff. Can you tell us about uh, that? That a great question. So, um, you know, the funny thing about this whole 
story was my sophomore year in college, um, a couple of my fraternity brothers and I started traveling to Las Vegas for spring break. And it was largely because it was cheap and we yeah. were broke. Um, the carding was, to be honest, a little lax. So we could get, we could get drinks as, as 19 and 20 <laughs> year olds. And then it was easy to get, you know, all we had to do was rent a car. We would shove a bunch of people into a cheap $40 room. And, but you could, you could get to places like LA and the Hoover Dam and get to kind of more interesting places. And then there really isn't a more epic place to watch March Madness, especially in the early weeks yeah. um, of watching basketball than Vegas, where yeah. there's like, you know, <laughs> 10 TVs with 10 games going on at the same time. And, and uh, that is so much fun. So um, we enjoyed gambling, but we were gamblers back then. So over the years, I kind of read a couple books on blackjack and other games like Pie Gal and craps and stuff. So I knew basic strategy. I knew the basics of what car counting was, but I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't practice the way you needed to. Yeah. So then my senior year, my girlfriend at the time sees a flyer um on campus uh, at MIT about the MIT blackjack team starting and she handed it to me and she goes well you like doing this stuff why don't you go check it out uh -huh. and so I was like okay so I attended that meeting in a classroom and discovered that a whole bunch of guys from Harvard and MIT from 19 like in the 1970s late 1970s were reforming the MIT blackjack team and we're going to teach us how to count uh -huh. so we practiced in classrooms and and uh, two of us passed on to this new team. Um, and we started going down to Foxwoods in, in yep. Connecticut to get <laughs> yeah, practice. Right. <laughs> I can tell you exactly when Foxwoods opened because it was Valentine's <laughs> Day of 1992, which is my senior year. <laughs> and um, we got field tested there. And then yeah. in the summer, we started going to Atlantic City and Vegas. Yeah. And uh, you know the the fun part was for those for two and a half years we we doubled the the bank the investment uh, um, every six months so I played till 1996 I played for four years and uh, and kind of from the fraternity side um, maybe five six folks that kind of uh, came after me joined the team as well and those are kind of the ones that that at least 21 and bringing that house were written about but. Uh, you know, and and again, just kind of maybe to give y'all your 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 listeners some context. Uh -huh. um, so the, my very last trip, I remember asking the pit boss at the MGM Grand. You know, hey, how much am I betting? Like, uh -huh. you know, and he said, well, you're averaging kind of twenty five hundred per hand, averaging two hands around, and about a hundred rounds an hour. Uh -huh. So basically, about a half million an hour. <laughs> and then you know, usually when we were out there, we played. You know eight, 10 hours a day. So wasn't uncommon for me to be putting out basically 5 million bucks a day on the tables. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> that's again. insane. So how did that experience like uh, shape, you know, everything that you did afterwards? Is there anything that you can reflect back on that? Like uh, the approach like that you uh, currently take to technology, product manager, other things. Is there anything that you reflect back and you, you, kind of think about that experience and uh, you see, you know, resemblance in how you do things today. Yeah, no, totally. And and kind of you see patterns, right? So, so many of the folks I have gambled with and were on the team have gone into entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a coincidence, right? Like, yeah. I think there's like, <laughs> you kind of get a little bit wired. Um, yeah. So, Because you're making you bets all the time when you're in entrepreneurship, you're always you know, <laughs> uh, waging your bets, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly what it is. And it's, yeah. you know, you know, I'm not sure it taught me that much about technology. Yeah. Product management, I'm sure there's some lessons there, but I didn't really do the work to think that through. But yeah. from a management and from an entrepreneurship perspective, um, there's so many lessons, right? Um, staying cool under pressure probably one of the biggest ones is understanding risk and reward, mm -hmm. right? That That is truly, like, truly understanding that in a business mm -hmm. um, is so, so important. Um, you know, learning that a team of complementary parts is usually a lot more effective and more sustainable than individuals. Mm -hmm. um, 
looking for opportunities to take advantage of irrational irrationality and, and human bias, right? Like that's so much about, you know, Moneyball, I feel like, and, and all of those concepts, right? Like that's that's so much blackjack. Um, oh, variance, right? Like all of blackjack, right? <laughs> How you make money in blackjack is all about variance. Well, those lessons about variance and understanding variance and, and you know, no matter, it's never a straight right? It's never the straight it's line. It's always all kinds of stuff. So understanding that is so valuable. So, and then every card's an independent trial, no matter how much you think there's patterns and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Most They're of the time, liars. <laughs> it's all independent trials. So yeah. don't, don't get too high in the positives. Don't get too low in the negatives because you know, the next card is also an independent trial, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were, um, and the last thing, like so much of the concepts around blackjack came from investment theory, right? So you have a you have a bucket of money, right? Your investment mm -hmm. um, on any given trip, you have so much with you, i.e., you give an investment manager X dollars, yeah, um, based on your returns and stuff like that, your expected returns, um, and then the variance, you know, right? You use things like Kelly Criterion. Mm -hmm. to determine right how much should i be investing in different things all of those concepts right were baked into everything we did in blackjack so again applying those same concepts and understanding you know money and, and how it can you know you take a lot of risk you're going to run out of money potentially very quickly mm -hmm. um, you can also get crazy rewards right so there, there's just so much. Like if you ask anyone at TASTOP, right, over the last 12 years, the company I worked for, um, the number of times I reference lessons I've learned when I was in my 20s playing blackjack, they'll be like, oh my God, that story again. And no, but it's it like, it, it, like you said, it's about people. And it's, what do you think in the context of teamwork and, uh, and what you did and uh, how, you know, how do you create great teams? Always, you know, the, there's the, you know, concept of that shared awareness, like as a team, can we, you know, uh, uh, be aware and synchronize as a team? Um, do we have, you know, uh, ability to see things from different perspectives what are some of the things when it comes to that team level uh that you think well i'll share i'll, I'll deep dive in one story because i think this will answer your question kind of in a, in a story form but uh in 1992 when i made the blackjack team right we were playing you know individual gambling against the house right and it was just an individual game and what happened kind of around 1993, the casinos started figuring out that if someone varied their bet more than four to one, mm -hmm. so let's say they bet a hundred bucks and then they went over $400, that was a kind of a signal that that was a card count. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so this is kind of where, you know, so they would kind of go, they would warn you, and then they would basically say, hey, Mr. Choksi, you're no longer, you know, welcome to play 21 at our house, you can, any longer, you're, you're more than welcome to play any of our other table games, which aren't beatable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you get the little conversation, and if you persist, they'll 86 you, at least in Las Vegas, which is basically read you the Trespass Act. Mm. Um, so, um, so again, right? the world changed and we were talking about change earlier about agility right and mm -hmm. this is exactly the same type of concept the world changed on us right the, di the the dynamics the parameters changed so you use creativity and you use you know you use your smarts and you go all right what can we do yeah and this is really where the team game came from so you had what was called spotters um yeah. so it was and and big players so one big player, kind of four, three to five spotters. Yeah. So the three to five spotters would go out and bet table minimum, let's say $100 on every hand. And they would keep count at five different tables. Yeah. Then when the count got high enough, i.e. it was a positive situation, they would call in the big player <laughs> you know, using a hand signal that was very innocuous, uh, um, you know, like scratching your head or something. Um, and 21 does a great job of describing some of those signals. They actually do a pretty good job of it. Um, and the big player sits down and bets 2000. So on the hundred dollar hands, right. Where you got five people out there, mm -hmm. the house advantage is about a half percent. So you lose 
50 cents on your expected value is a loss of 50 cents there. Okay. The big player sits down, maybe starts betting, let's say two grand a hand, right? With a half percent or a 0.7% advantage. Uh -huh. So that's an expected value of significantly <laughs> higher. And all of a sudden you could do a 20 to one bet variation uh -huh. using a team game. So this concept and this cat, so again, right? Like it was something we would have never even been able to get away with when we were betting individually, but mm -hmm. now you could optimize the system because you've got kind of a, a group of a, a team, a group of team working together. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that's, I think it does two things. One, that's kind of a teaming story, but also kind of, um, also kind of back to agility and, and dealing with change, right? This cat and mouse game between the casinos and the players, I mean, happened always, right? And you're constantly, <laughs> like, that was just one example, but it was constantly adjusting. And so, yeah. you know, you had to learn agility quickly because otherwise you were going to be walked out of the place. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like that, const, you know, that we talk about constant inspect and that, inspect and that, but it's also like, it's making me think of like, you know, uh, as the environment probably gets more complex, there is a need for that teamwork, right? In organizations, it's hard to deliver work with one person or like, so, so the, the idea of, you know, teams of teams or the idea of team, you know, being able to deliver in, in, in as a team, uh, is essential and then you know all of the other things that go into like how do you create a team obviously you guys wouldn't be able to do it if you th th there wasn't some type of trust or levels of trust and uh, um, uh, uh, ability to to you know work with each other so <clears throat> and I'm sure it was oh, yeah. fun too. You know, when you're carrying around you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash uh, yeah, that, that that's a whole nother level of trust than any well, other that's, level yeah, it's... of trust that you could have yeah. So but it was super interesting, interesting yeah. right? Because people have asked me why why didn't you, why didn't you steal, right? Like why didn't you just mm -hmm. pocket some of the money? And you know the opportunity to be part of the team and the opportunity, right? You know the the value to me of of doing this for four years as opposed to getting kicked off the team <laughs> yeah. never made sense. Plus, they had the metrics, they had the numbers, mm -hmm. right? So. For any given expected value, right? Like this is just a, a normal distribution of what should happen. And at some point it becomes really obvious that what should have happened, you know, this is no longer variance. There's something going on here. Yeah. So that was the other piece that's super interesting, right? That it, if, if let's say my ethics or my morality didn't stop me from doing it, mm -hmm. um, my brain stopped me from doing it because mm -hmm. Uh, it would at some point become obvious just simply because you're not returning as much money as you should be given the situations yeah. you're being walked into. So is that uh, that's interesting because uh, <clears throat> because it, it's not just your morals and your values, but it's also the transparency and uh, that it created that it reinforced even uh, that behavior even though it may have let's just say gone against your values or uh, or uh, uh, you know morals so interesting uh, let's uh, we could talk more people will think you that don't know you they'll think you're a gambler why did you bring this gambler uh, uh, could, could we talk about how did you uh, meet uh, Mick Kirsten and uh, how did you join him as uh, president and CEO of Tastop? how was uh, what was that encounter? Like, what do you remember about Mick first? And yeah. could you maybe talk about that? Well, let me, uh, it's a little weird way to get a job. So let me, let me give a little bit of background <laughs> on that and then we'll, we can get into Mick. But uh, so um, uh, I had joined a kind of a, an open source company called Spring Source. It's the company behind the Spring Java framework. Mm -hmm. um and uh really to help lead the business side right great technologists there um you know one of the things i did there was help kind of transition it from a services company to in a training company to really more of a subscription product company uh, raised a couple rounds of funding kind of all of that stuff mm -hmm. um but along the way we were missing a skill set um in the company and and kind of recognized it and knew to compete, we needed to have um, tooling 
that that kind of you know command line is great for a lot of people but but sometimes <laughs> you need something that's going to make it easier for the masses right so we desperately knew we needed tooling so we um uh, our CTO at the time, Adrian Collier, knew from his IBM days about this PhD student who had just graduated and uh, had started a company. Um, and so he introduced us to Mick, um, and he was a big, um, very highly involved in the Eclipse Foundation. We wanted our tooling to be based in Eclipse. So um, so we started talking to him and basically signed Castop at the time mm -hmm. to a million-dollar services contract, um, you know, these these seven people fresh out of college <laughs> um, or fresh out of a mixed case out of his PhD program yeah. and uh and um that's really how like I like I first met Mick negotiating a contract <laughs> and um as uh interestingly as part of that contract um negotiation at one point we ended up in Bangalore India together and that was the first time we met in person yeah. Um, at a at a conference, speaking at the same conference, and so you know, there's something about sitting down in front of somebody, maybe over a, a you know adult beverage or two, uh -huh. and banging out all of the details that needed to happen. Like what, like you know, one of our big concerns at that time, this will date me for sure, was J Boss, right? Like yeah. that, they were our arch rivals, <laughs> right? and we're like, well we don't want JBoss hiring you to do what we just got you to do. So, uh, <laughs> but we, we, we also can't force exclusivity that like, that was going to be too expensive. So like, well, how about a board observer seat? Mm -hmm. And so at least we would know if you're going to about to sign up, you know, or, or our tribe. Mm -hmm. So I ended up with a board observer seat and then we invested a little bit of money in the company and, um, but yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, this was someone who liked, you know, um, at MIT, we always talked about, you know, uh, work hard, party hard, right? Play hard. Mm -hmm. And um, and Mick kind of lived that every single day. Yeah. And um, and I just thought, wow, this is a pretty cool dude. And like smarts off the, off the charts. And that's how I met Mick. And then for the next three years, I was an advisor, board member, and, uh, and then kind of... Um, uh, I was leaving Amazon. Amazon had acquired a, a different company of mine and ended up uh, Mick convinced me to join day to day. And that was, uh, that was kind of how we got there. So nice. Yeah. Um, th that's yeah, no, that's very uh, uh, interesting. And there is that, I think, you know, a lot of people that are driven, like have to balance that both, uh, uh, you, you know, the, 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 day-to-day -day stuff but also try to have you know some fun and, and try to make the environment because i think a lot of people at the, the, those roles are looking up to you and uh it, it's uh sometimes can be a, a a tough situation to be in uh as a as a president ceo or somebody that's leading a company uh, could you maybe talk about some things that are maybe not uh, specific or not uh, uh, known, uh, but like, what are the challenges it's th that, uh, you know, COO, president, like, you know, you're looking at the operations, you're looking at, you know, how to run a company. And uh, a lot of times it's easy to point fingers and say, you know, <laughs> they don't get it or they're not, you know, uh, uh, but for those that don't have day-to-day -day insights or maybe some of the challenges that somebody like COO or president deals with. Could you maybe talk about the some of the things that you dealt with that you found challenging, but maybe people, you know, developers and others, you know, that are down that, that may point the finger but not really know what's going on, you know, in your yeah. Life. I mean, I've had this. You have to kind of understand my biases, so I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of those, but I've had this very, I, I didn't realize it until a few years ago, but my history has been um, working with technical kind of founder types, mm -hmm. um, first time managing people, first time CEOs, first time, but, but very technical. And then... Um, I kind of call it uh, a buddy of mine, Bajoy Goswami calls it the power of two, but, you know, so you've got this um, bright eyed, you know, like 
the world's new and fresh and everything's exciting, kind of brand new entrepreneur. And then you you pair that with someone like me, who's old and curmudgeon <laughs> and, <laughs> and difficult and, yeah. and, and, you know, and, you know, if I was dictator, it would never work because I would be worrying about which monsters were lurking around what corners all the time. Yeah. And if they're a dictator, it would never work well either because, you know, they're always like, oh, shiny new object, let's go, right? And, <laughs> and that, um, that pairing and that balancing act is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of there's some tricks we used and we kind of formalized it, but whenever Mick came to Austin or when I went to Vancouver, which is where Mick lives yeah. and I live in Austin, um, we would stay with each other. We would stay in each other's houses, not in hotels. And it wasn't because we were being cheap. Maybe some of the time was because we were being cheap. But mostly it was because that's how you know, that's how you really get to know someone, right? And mm -hmm. it, it isn't a coincidence I led with, I am, you know, my family, right? Like mm -hmm. Mick knows my family. I know his family. Yeah. Um, they used to call their guest room my, my, my room <laughs> in his house. <laughs> but, you know, you get to see their challenges and their life, right? And that's what brings you closer. And when you're working 80 hours, 100 hours, when you're trying to raise money and everyone tells you, you know, your baby's ugly, yeah. uh, you've got to have things you can fall back on. And life intrudes, right? Like there's no world where life doesn't intrude if, if your kid's having a challenge or, or something like that. So um, to me, I think what I've learned over the years is that um, the journey is all encompassing and it's really the journey, right? Like the most, what you would consider the most miserable times. I, I remember at Spring Source, we were, we were putting our pitch deck together for an investor and we had pulled an all nighter and, and it was just like a, a hellish weekend. <laughs> but I still remember slogging through that with Rod and, and, and that's, you know, like, yes, that turned out well. Yes. People gave us money. That was great. Yeah. But it's not about that. It's about that journey. It's about working together and fighting together and 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 like accomplishing uh, getting the the task done and yeah. then right, letting the outcomes are the outcomes. You can't control those. You can only control the inputs that you put into it mm -hmm. and and try strive for the best. And uh, you know, I, I think that fighting in the trenches and all of that, like, I have lifelong friends with with those co-founders, those 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 folks yeah. I've worked with, and I think that that's pretty telling about those brutal times. Yeah. But but that's what I appreciate the most after the fact. Yeah, and I think it's those uh, I mean specifically relationships that that are born out of those uh, experiences and uh, um, that that really kind of you know. Sh sh a lot of times shape us but also like create the 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 help create the culture so uh, a lot of times when i talk to organizations or when we're discussing you know it's always like change the culture but it's really the culture big part of the culture and how healthy the culture is what's the relationship uh, between the people like do they you know like working with each other what what are those experiences that they're going through and how they're developing those relationships would they invite each other <laughs> to sleep you know uh because that that like i agree that that tells a lot and you learn a lot by just building those uh, relationships and getting closer to like knowing who, who we really are and being vulnerable with each other you're more likely to be vulnerable with somebody if somebody's sleeping at your house than if you just hey you know um as a COO, um, you know, your responsibility is kind of overseeing the operations. And uh, how would you describe the operations at TaskTop? Like, what were, what would be your description of it? What are the challenges? <laughs> what are the <laughs> uh, things that maybe listeners would find helpful? Yeah. I mean, it's funny because, to be honest, yes, my title uh, was Chief Operating Officer. Um, um Operations was probably a bit of a misnomer um, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, right? The the early breakdown was really Mick led the technology side, which yeah. great hands there. And right, I can say that for all of my companies, right? Yeah. Rod led the technology. I knew we were going to produce great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Mark, you know, Patrick, um, Abe produced the technology. I knew we were going to produce incredible stuff. 
my job at the end of the day was how can I build a business that can support this phenomenal stuff mm. that, you know, like some of the smartest that I've, I've been so fortunate to work with some of the smartest technologists in the world. And so that suddenly becomes a very easy problem, right? I don't have to not, I believe in what we're doing. I know we're going to produce incredible stuff. Um, so my job was really everything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially in the early days, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, like one of the interesting things, right, was like, if you go back to the very early days, I was doing finance, like I did our books, I did, um, I did, you know, actually Mick did IT support, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sales and, and marketing and, and partnerships and all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start to bring in people, right? Like we raised our first round and we had to bring in a CFO. And Simon, you know, love Simon to death, right? Like, because he was a CFO who lived in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so many CFOs were like, oh, it's just all about the numbers, right? Yeah. To be honest, he handled all the operations. IT rolled up to him, legal rolled up to him. All of the supporting functions, mm -hmm. normally called operations, were his. My, my shift then went to go to market. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was all that was where I focused on. And then over time, we hired a uh, chief customer officer. Right. Mm -hmm. And who's phenomenal. And that's part of the game. Right. As you grow, you want to bring in like I'm, I'm a good generalist, mm -hmm. but I'm not an expert in marketing or sales or customer success. Exactly. We would bring in specific individuals that had crazy amounts of experience. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of being a generalist, and I think this is what. I think has made me pretty good at my job is I would then fill in the holes as they came mm -hmm. up when we lost our, our head of customer success, right? I managed customer success for a year until we found Bruce. Exactly. And so to me, that's been a big part of my journey is, is playing the role that I needed to at various points in time. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been, you know, at the end of the day, right. It was, it was Mick, Simon, and me. It was then a, a seven-person leadership team yeah. uh, that that we worked together and, and made decisions and, and participated in stuff. Um, the other piece that that I think is also super important is, you know, uh, the corp dev and the financing and the investor relations piece, right? Like, if you raise money, and I'm a huge fan of bootstrapping. Half my businesses I bootstrapped, half I've raised money on. Yeah. Um, massive massive believer in the right action right time but as a but when you raise money it's not just who you raise money with it's the hundred people you talk to and build relationships <laughs> with yeah. over the years mm -hmm. so you know a year ago we we raised um we raised money with a growth equity firm called sumerian right that was a 10-year journey wow. right? we met george kadeep but he ran hp software 10 years ago and he remembered us from then. He's gone on to become the managing director of Sumeru. Uh -huh. And so, right, and we maintain relationships with him. We, we pointed him to other folks. We would meet with him once or twice, you know, once a year, maybe once every two years uh -huh. over that time. And finally, we got to the size where that investment was appropriate, uh -huh. right action, right time. And, right, for every George, I've got a hundred other people that that it didn't work out with. Exactly, so, but there's there's a couple of things. I mean, like that that kind of stand out. Maybe the at least for me, uh, uh, the 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 that generalist that you describe yourself as, I, I think, is essential. It's almost and you know if you had even a couple more people like yourself that can step in and do that. And we talk a lot about you know being generalist, having like a maybe you know a deep skill in something else but also having more generalists and i think uh, <clears throat> when it comes to organizations when it comes to that building that resilience uh there is uh that balance between specialists and generalists and having more generalists uh to help uh uh with that so i think that's something that i'm seeing more and more that organizations don't fully when going back to that fitness how do we have more generalists at all levels of the organization that can fill in that gap when is necessary. So, and then the other thing, they, the the other topic that you described, in my opinion, goes back to the relationships. I mean, like building those relationships inside the company, but outside of the company to actually, you know, uh, uh, 
you never know. It's it's almost like uh, it's investment that you make and something might come out of it, something may not. But as somebody in an organization that's responsible for that side, you're always kind of out there and building those relationships. And that's kind of, you know, probably where you s- <laughs> spend most of the time. But um, is there anything, I, I mean, like those are the two things that really stand out uh, when it comes to the roles or that level in the organization that you're playing. Uh, or uh, supporting um, from your perspective, is that how you see it? Or maybe like, is there anything that you want to sh- share or am I missing? No, I think, there? Yeah. I think you've hit a couple of things, right? Like the generalist one is pretty interesting, right? Because as you grow in size, right? Yeah. You know, at, at a plan view who acquired us recently, um, right? That's a 1300 person company, right? You need, right, generalists become less valuable in that world, right? You now need people doing certain things, and, and that's where specialists, and, and again, right, at CEO, at certain levels, generalists are still super important because they got to understand everything or a yeah. whole lot of stuff. Um, but I do find that as companies get bigger, you find, you know, the role, the places where generalists become important, right, are are still there. You need to be able to manage a group of specialists at the end of the exactly. day to, yeah. to move in the same direction. But but it starts to adjust a little bit. But even like finance, like somebody in finance being able to understand, like, you know, how do I change? Like how, you know, that's just being stuck in a traditional way of looking at finance. But like, for instance, how do we fund, you know, products and things like that? And being able to like learn enough and be a generalist enough to understand, for instance, how to support you, or how to support somebody in other areas. So that's kind of like, you know, uh, like what was going through my head. But maybe... <clears throat> You mentioned the uh, 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 past of being acquired by PlanView. Uh, I think probably a lot of uh, the listeners want to know, uh, you know, what made a good fit, uh, and how did that acquisition come about? Probably relationships too. <laughs> if I had, to... ironically, yes, yeah. um, another one that's twelve years in the making, right? Yeah. Um, and and as I mentioned, I'm in Austin. PlanView is headquartered in Austin, so. Um, and we met them at an IBM conference, probably for the first time in 2010. I think it was, yeah, I'm positive it's 2010. And so my daughter plays travel softball. So, you know, three times a week, I'm driving by this, this building that says plan view on it. And it just drove me nuts because I'm like, oh my God, how could these guys not be partnering with us? And, and we could not break in for the longest time. But we kept chipping away. We kept trying. We never gave up. And then, um, interestingly, we had a partnership with LeanKit, who yeah. got acquired by PlanView. I remember that. And for the first time, they actually saw what we could do, not from our voice, but from somebody else's voice. Mm-hmm. And that was the change in the relationship. And then we've been partners for about five years working together. Um, and uh, and then culminating in most recently in, in the acquisition a month ago. But um, as far as what was compatible and why it worked and why it made sense, um, you know, the first thing I would kind of say is the compatibility of vision and goals, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you think of us as puzzle pieces, yes, they're a bigger set of puzzle pieces and we're a smaller <laughs> set of puzzle pieces, yeah. um, about a thousand, you know, about five times our size. But we filled the value stream management hole for them. We filled the ability to talk to other tools for them. We didn't do 90% of the things they did. They have, uh, they're have they strong in enterprise agile. They're strong in strategic portfolio management. Um, so, so one, the puzzle pieces fit together. It's probably the first thing I would say. Um, and it, this really is a case where one plus one or maybe 0. 0.2 plus one <laughs> is three. Um, better, yeah. And then... You know, at the end of that, right? Like, like Mick wrote the book. Mick, Mick is is kind of like larger than life, and the the amount of respect they showed for Mick, and, and mm-hmm. you know, he's going to be the he is the CTO for the joint company. Yeah. So, I mean, right there, that tells you a whole lot about you know the the value they placed in him, and it, it's super important that um, anyone who we are going to work with had to believe in the vision that Mick has and, and, mm-hmm. and what he believed in because we built a company around that. Uh, and then culture, we've talked about culture a lot. 
the cultures are very, very similar, right? Like, uh, I always joke that Tassed Up were the, the milk and cookies guys and girls, right? <laughs> because we generally did things the right way. We weren't the jerks. We weren't, right? Like, we, we tried to not just play by the rules, but kind of like rules that we could, you know, a code that we could sleep with at night. And that was super, super important to us. Um, you know, we have, we, we've been known to fire high performing assholes, sorry, um, <laughs> high performing jerks yeah. um, over the years. Right. And, and, you know, that's really hard to do when someone's really good at their job, mm -hmm. but that's, we thought it was more important to maintain our culture than it was to deliver results even in some cases. And in plan view matches that, we see a lot of that in, in there. And then at the end of the day, sometimes it is about the other side wanting you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. And I think it's also like in the in the space, like the, it, it's good that uh, <clears throat> there's a little bit more alignment in tooling. And I hope that, uh, you know, more and more companies and like at least what I know what TaskTop uh, stood for, is that it's it's not just that one size fits all. It's like focusing on those uh, things that will truly make business uh, impacts rather than right. like what is my velocity or whatever you know uh, we track. So um, we don't have you know a lot of time here, but I wanted to ask you about uh, you know the value stream management. Uh, you're part of the value stream uh, consortium. Um, you attended uh, uh, for a little bit, I think, uh, the value stream management conference that I uh, ran. What is your uh, thought? on the current state and the future of the value stream management in the world of agility? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, value stream management's still relatively in its, let's call it teenage years at the most, right? Um, it's not infancy, but it's definitely not adulthood yet either. It's somewhere in between, so maybe preteen. Um, and value stream is super important right in the history of software right you, you see this ebb and flow right it, mm. it you know for a while it's all about you know, go back to the rational days it was all about the big picture right and all about the system mm -hmm. and then um you know agile comes along um devops comes along uh, you know there was massive kind of uh innovation in testing massive innovation in in how you how you code uh you know, massive innovation in, in how you deliver, right? Cloud has changed the way you deliver completely. Exactly. So there's been all of this innovation kind of over the last 15 years in the silos. Mm -hmm. And that's not now producing the results because the problems now are between the silos. Mm -hmm. So the time for something like value stream management is very, very appropriate, right? Um, you know, looking at things from a systems view, um, into right and value stream management definitionally is about delivering value to customers whether internally or external mm -hmm. and then it's okay what is impeding the way of of delivering value to the customers right and at task up we talk a lot about flow but we're talking about agility at the end of the day right it, it's exactly. it's two sides of the same coin and at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. So value stream management, I think, provides this infrastructure and this approach to thinking about things from an end-to-end -end perspective, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, and we've known this from lean manufacturing for ages, right? You fix the wrong bottleneck <laughs> and you just make the, the actual bottleneck worse. Make it worse, yeah, exactly. So the ability to identify where the problem is not, you know, um, Oh, gosh, uh, John Smart has this slide that uh, has been around forever. And the yay, we're so agile slide. So he shows yeah. like, you know, three months to make an investment. Well, I, I know, I know exactly. The, yeah, I, I'll put it <laughs> maybe in the, in the description down so people can, yeah. Yeah, but that's a per, that's the problem value stream management solves. It's not suddenly getting agile here mm -hmm. and everything else takes, you know, 16 months to get out the door. It's about how do you deliver to the customer? And, and, you know, sometimes automating DevOps isn't the right answer if you're bottleneck somewhere else. Exactly. Fix that. Play whack-a-mole. I always call it whack-a-mole. Play whack-a-mole. Hit that <laughs> mole. Identify. Hopefully you fixed it. And then identify what the next biggest bottleneck is. Mm -hmm. And so at Tastop and, and I think real value stream management folks view it as, can we make one 
half a percent, two percent improvements every week or two. Mm. And over a year, that adds up to 30, 40 percent improvements. And uh, that's where the, the magic happens. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's the future in the sense that uh, it, it's like even Agile, even Scrum, everything that we've done, like you said, we like sub-optimized, but like it hasn't really been viewed as an end-to-end -end delivery, right? And in order to do that, at least when I work with clients, it's like it's rare to see leaders that are encouraging and, and creating environment through measurements, through whatever, through transparency to actually see that customer delivery you know, end to end. Um, it's hard, right? Yeah. Organizations aren't structured properly for that. It, yeah. it is fundamentally hard, right? So I don't want to, but the cool thing now is that the technology with APIs and, and, and kind of information flowing and stuff like that is available to like at least that. make it doable. I'm not saying it's not easy, right? You still, you got to fight with this VP and this VP, maybe to, to push a change through it. Right, that's still hard to get done in organizations, yeah. but at least now the infrastructure, the data, and the things you need to have those conversations exist. And tell a story. That's what I was going to say. I recently had and I was talking to uh, a couple of uh, guys here from a company called Wex, um, publicly traded mm -hmm. company, and they use the data, you know, and to show to their teams and to their management is what's going on and to paint a picture. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, it, it, it's telling a story and being able to tell people like, how is this impeding our, uh, how is this a bottleneck? And then using that data to make some uh, changes, um, which brings me to my last question. Uh, and this is probably we can spend more than what we have time than what we have. But what should be measured and what should not be measured from your perspective? This is a, a tricky question to answer because, like everything, <laughs> context matters, and yeah. and kind of who you are and where you are matters, right? Uh, what what an engineering manager needs to be measured is going to to optimize for the job he he or she needs to do is very different than what should be measured for a VP of applications, which is also very different than what should be measured for a CTO, and, or at least minimally the data should be sliced different. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm biased because again uh, we've referenced <laughs> him a few times, but Dr. Mick Kirsten, our CEO and founder, wrote a book called Project to Product. And in that, he has identified five flow metrics. And the beauty of the flow metrics are that they provide five really simple to understand metrics that both the business and technologists can understand, technology leaders can understand. Mm -hmm. And I think that is at least for where we're focusing and kind of the end to end and kind of a little bit of a bigger picture. Um, that's so important, right? And even the words are, are English, right? Flow efficiency, <laughs> flow value, or flow velocity, flow time, mm -hmm. flow distribution, flow load. So it's something that both sides can wrap their arms around. And we believe that the current state of affairs is that the problems arise from, like I said earlier, the silos and, and mm -hmm. not thinking systems wide. And then from the business and the technology folks not being on the same page. Exactly. And I think what Mick um, really nailed was he didn't leave those metrics and improving flow on its own. He tied them to business results. Exactly. Again, things people, everyone can understand, <laughs> value, cost, quality, happiness. Mm -hmm. So um, long story short, those are our bias metrics. We think they're a great place to start. We think they help you with that big picture. We think they're key to VSM. And um and again, uh, if your readers want to learn more about those, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Yeah. But if you visit Nick's book site, projecttoproduct.org, um, mm -hmm. you can you can learn a lot more about the, the flow metrics and about the book. Yeah, and I'll include those uh, links that I mentioned, including that graphic too in the description. But I think that's uh, that's one thing that at least I've seen over the last five years that there's more alignment in metrics between business and IT. There's more of uh, uh, I like essentially it used to be seen as like IT transformation and was driven from IT. Now right. there's more of you know uh, where it's driven by business and these type of metrics uh, and views 
end-to-end -end views uh, that you know value stream management and the you know just in general lean promotes uh, that we have to look at you know the big picture where the bottlenecks are and remove each bottleneck at a time. Um, what would you like to leave us with for the for the end? Uh, uh, is there a message or anything that you would like to uh, share? No, this is fun. This was fun prepping for, and this is fun uh, having the conversation. I, I hope uh, I hope your readers find a little bit of value. I suspect this isn't. Uh, I looked at a few of your past podcasts, and uh, I suspect this will be a little bit different directionally, given just some of the twists and turns in my life. But uh, but I, I Milan, I, I really appreciate you having me, and uh, and it's been a it's a topic that I realize is is something I've been living for mm -hmm. most of the last twenty years. Um, and, and you gave me some, an opportunity to put some words to it, so I appreciate that.